Hello, and I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE Media and co-host of theCUBE. We're here in Palo Alto at our studio here. I'm joined with Joseph Jacks, who's the founder and general partner of OSS Capital, open source software capital is what OSS stands for. He's also the founder of KubeCon, which now is part of the CNCF. Um, and it's a huge conference around Kubernetes. Uh, he's a cloud guy, knows open source, uh, very well respected in the industry and also a great guest, friend of the Cube, Cube alumni. Joseph, great to see you. Also known as JJ. JJ, good to see you. Thank you for having me on again, John. Hey, great to have you come on. I know we've talked many times on the Cube, but you got some exciting news. You got a new um, firm, OSS Capital, open source software, not operational support like a telco, but this is uh, an investment opportunity where you're making investments. Yep. Congratulations. Thank you. So I know you can't talk about some of the uh, specifics on the fund size, but the, you are actually going to go out, talk to entrepreneurs, make some in, uh, equity investments. Yep around open source software. Um, what's the thesis? What's the, how did you get here? Why, why did you do it? What's motivating you and what's the thesis? A lot of questions in there. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a really um, profoundly huge year for open source software um, on a bunch of different levels. I think the biggest kind of thing everyone anchors towards is, you know, GitHub uh, being acquired by Microsoft, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the, the two huge Hadoop vendors join forces. That, that I think surprised a lot of people. Um, you know, MuleSoft, which is a, a, a big op open source middleware um, company getting acquired by Salesforce, uh, just a year after going public, which is a, a, a huge outcome. Um, I think one observation, just to sort of like summarize the year, 2018, is actually starting in January, almost on sort of like a monthly basis, We've, we've, we've observed a major sort of open source software company outcome. Uh, and sort of kicking off the year, we had CoreOS getting acquired by Red Hat. Uh, Brandon and Alex, uh, the founders over there, built a really interesting mm -hmm. company in the Kubernetes ecosystem. And uh, I think in, in, in uh, February, Alfresco, which is an open source um, uh, content portal, uh, uh, taking uh, 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 pr privatization sort of outcome from a private equity firm. I, I believe in March we had um, Magento getting acquired by Adobe, which is an open source based CMS, PHP CMS. So just a lot of, um, a lot of activity for significant outcomes, uh, multi-billion dollar outcomes of commercial open source companies. So, and, and open source software is something like 20 years old, 20 years in the making. And this year in particular, we've just seen just a huge amount of large scale outcomes uh, that have been many years in the making from companies that have taken lots of venture funding. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in a lot of cases, sort of um, partially focused funding from different, different investors that have an affinity for open source software and sort of understand the, the, the uniqueness of the open source model when it's applied to business, when it's applied to company building. But um, more, more sort of opportunistic and sort of affinity oriented as opposed to a pure focus. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of been part of the motivation. I, I'd say the more authentically kind of um, compelling motivation for doing this is that it just needs to exist. Um, you know, this is sort of a model that is, is happening by necessity. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more and more software companies be open source software companies, mm -hmm. so open source first. Um, they're built in a distributed way. They're, they're leveraging engineers and talent around the world, which is part of this open source kind of philosophy. Mm -hmm. And they are fundamentally kind of commercial open source software yeah. companies. And so uh, we felt that if you had a firm basically designed in a way to exclusively focus on those kinds of companies and where the firm was actually backed and supported by the founders of the largest commercial open source companies in the world before, uh, you know, be before sort of the last decade, yeah. um, that that could actually deliver a lot of value. So we, we we've been sort of blogging a little bit about this. Um, oh, you have, wrote a great post on yeah. I, I read about open source monetization. Yeah. And I think one of the things I'm uh, I'm seeing as well that supports your thesis, um, and I'd like to get your reaction to it because I think this is something that's not really talked about. But open source is still young. I mean, you go back, yep. I, mean, I'm, I remember the days when we used to have to hide in the shadows to get licenses and, and pirate stuff and do all those crazy stuff. But now it's only, only a couple decades away. 
the leaders that were investing were usually entrepreneurs that have been successful. Yeah. The Rob Beardens, the Amr Awadallahs, the guys who did Spring, all yep. these different open source, Linux, obviously great success story. But there hasn't any been any institutional, yeah, you got benchmark, other things, done some, done some investments. Yes. But a discipline around open source, yep. where open source is now table stakes in all software development. Yep. Cloud is scaling, scaling out globally. There's no real focus, there's never been a firm that's been focused on Correct. just open source from a commercial while maintaining the purity and ethos of open source. Right. I mean, is that, that's you true. agree? That's 100%, yeah, that's been the, 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 the big part of creating the firm is aligning and solving for a pure focused structure. And I, I think what I'll say abstractly is um, the sort of venture, uh, venture, capital venture style approach to funding um, enterprise technology companies, software companies in general, has been to kind of find great entrepreneurs in, in an abstract way that can build great technology companies, can bring them to market, can sell them, and can scale them and, and so on and, and, and either create categories or dominate existing categories and disrupt incumbents and so on. And I think while that has worked for quite a while in the venture industry overall, in, in the 50, 60 years of the venture industry, lots of successful firms, I think what we're starting to see is a necessary shift toward accounting um, for the fundamental differences of open source software as it relates to new technology getting created and going, and, 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 new, and new, new software companies kind of coming into market. And so we, we, we actually fundamentally believe that um, commercial open source software companies are fundamentally different yeah. functionally in almost every way as compared to proprietary closed source software companies of the last 30 years. Um, and w the way we've sort of designed our firm and, and we're, we're um, we'll be about 10 people pretty soon. We're just about a month in, so we're growing, we're growing the team quickly, but you know, sort of a small focused team is... Well, um, 10's not focused small. I mean, I know venture firms that have <laughs> 2 billion in management that don't have like more than 20 people. Well, we have portfolio partners that are focused in different functional areas uh, where commercial open source software companies have really fundamental differences. If you were to sort of stack rank um, by function where commercial open source software companies are, are really fundamentally different, sort of top to bottom, mm -hmm. legal would be probably the very top of the list, yeah. right? In terms of license, compliance management, structuring, um, all the sort of uh, protections and provisions around how intellectual property is actually shipped to and sold to customers. Um, the legal licensing aspects of commercial, commercial software licensing, this is quite a polarizing hot topic these days. Um, the second big functional area uh, where we, we, we have a, a, a portfolio partner focused on this is finance. Um, finance is another area where commercial open source software companies have to sort of behaviorally orient and apply that function very, very differently as compared to proprietary software companies. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're crazy honored and, and excited to have world experts and very respected uh, leaders in those different areas sort of helping to provide sort of different like sort of pillars of wisdom to our portfolio co companies, our portfolio founders in those different functional areas. And we provide a really focused kind of structure for well, that. Well, I want to ask you the, the kind of the question that kind of bridges the old way and new way, because I definitely see you guys definitely being new, new and different, which yeah. is good. Uh, or in, as Andy Jassy would say, you can be misunderstood for a while, but as you become successful, people will start understanding what you do. And that's a great example of Amazon. So, but, but the, the pattern with success is, Traditionally the same, if you, if you kind of encapsulate the, the, the difference between open source old and new, and that is you have something of value and you're disrupting a market and collecting rents from it, okay? Or, or revenue or profit. So that's commercial, that's how businesses run. How are you guys going to disrupt with open source software the next generation um, value creation? Uh, we know how value is created, certainly in software, the open source has shown a path on how to create value in writing software if code is value and functionality is value. But to commercialize and create revenue, which is people paying some, for something, yep. that's a little bit different kind of value extraction from val the value creation. So, Correct. so if open source software can create value in, in its functionality and value product, now you bring it to the market, you get paid for it, that's, you have to disrupt somebody, you have to create right. something. How are you looking at that? What's the vision of the creation? the extraction of value, who's disrupted, is it greenfield, new, new opportunities? How do you think, how do you, what's your vision? A lot of, lot of nuance and complexity in that, in that question. I, what I would say is, 
Well, open source is creating products. Cr 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 well, open source is the basis for creating products um, in a different kind of way. So I'll, I'll go back to your question around, let's just sort of maybe simplify it as the value creation and the value capture dynamics, right? right. Um, we've, we've sort of written a few posts about this and, and it's, it's subtle, but it's easy to understand if you look at it from a fundamental kind of perspective. So um, we actually believe, and we'll, we'll be publishing you know, research on this and maybe even some uh, sort of more principled scientific, perhaps even ways of looking at it and then blog posts and research. But um, we, we believe that open source software will always generate or create orders of magnitude more value than any constituent can capture, right? And that's a fundamental way of looking at it. So if you see um, how cloud providers are capturing value that open source creates, whether it's you know, Elasticsearch or Postgres or MySQL or Hadoop, um, uh, and then commercial open source software companies that capture value that open source software creates, whether it's companies like Confluent around Kafka or Cloudera around Hadoop or uh, you know, Databricks around uh, Apache Spark, um, or whether it's the creators of those projects, uh, the creators of, of Spark and Hadoop and uh, Elasticsearch. S sometimes many of them are the founders of those companies I mentioned, Some yeah. of them, somet sometimes they're not. Um, mm -hmm. We just believe regardless of how that sort of value is captured by the cloud providers, the commercial vendors, or the creators, um, the value created relative to the value captured will always be orders and orders of magnitude greater. And this is, this is expressed in, a, in another way, which is maybe easier to understand, so sort of yeah. um, reinforcing this kind of assertion that there's orders of magnitude value created far greater than what can be captured. Um, if you were to do a survey, which we're currently in the process of doing, and I'm happy to sort of say that publicly for the first time here, um, of all the commercial open source software companies that have projects with large significant adoption, whether say for example it's Docker uh, with millions of users or um, Apache Hadoop, how many Hadoop deployments there are, how many customers, uh, companies are there running Hadoop deployments, uh, or um, it maybe even MySQL, uh, how, many, how many MySQL installations are there? And then you were to sort of um, s survey those companies and see how many end users are there relative to how many customers are paying for uh, the usage of mm -hmm. the, 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 the project, it would probably be something like if there were a million uh, users of a given project, um, the company behind that project or the cloud provider or say the, 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 the end user, um, uh, the, the developer behind the project, is, 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 is unlikely to capture more, more than say 1% uh, or a couple of percent of those end users to companies, to paying companies, uh, to paying customers. Um, and many times it's, that's high. Many times one to 2% is very high. I mean, often often yeah. what we've seen actually anecdotally, and we're doing yeah. principled research around this and we'll have, we'll have data here uh, across a large number of companies. Um, many times it's a fraction of 1%, yeah. uh, which is just sort of maybe sometimes 10% of 1% or even uh, smaller. So, um, so the practitioners will be making more money than the actual vendors. Absolutely right. And this is really- End users and practitioners always stand to benefit far greater because of the fundamental nature of open source. Yeah. Uh, it's permissionless, it's disaggregated, the value creation dynamics are untethered, yeah. and it is fundamentally yeah. freely available to use, freely available to contribute to with yeah. different constraints mm -hmm. based on the license. Um, however, all those things are sort of like disaggregating the creation of technology into sort of like an unbounded network. Yeah. And that's, that's really, okay. really so, incredible. So first of all, I agree yep. with your premise 100%. We've seen it with the queue where videos yeah, are and free. And that's a good thing. All those things are good. And, and Dave Vellante says this all the time in the queue. And we actually pointed this out and called this in the Hadoop ecosystem yep. in 2012. In mm -hmm. fact, we actually said that in the queue and it turned out to be true because look at Hortonworks and Cloudera had to merge. Uh, because again, the market changed very quickly because value was created around them, and you had cloud, et cetera. So the question is, that changes the valuation mechanisms. So if this is true, which we believe it is, to say it is, yeah. then the traditional net present value cash flow <laughs> metric of the value of the firm, not your firm, but like if I'm an open source firm, if I'm only one portion of the extraction, I'm a supplier and I'm an enabler, the valuation on cash flow 
might not be as great as the real impact. So the question I have for you, have you thought about the valuation? Because now you're thinking about a bigger construct, community, um, network effects. Yep. These are new dynamics. I don't think anyone's actually crunched a valuation model around this. Um, so if someone knew that, say for example, an open source project created all this value, yes. and they weren't necessarily harvesting it from a cash flow perspective, mm -hmm. there might be other ways to monetize it. Have you thought about that and what's your reaction to that concept of, okay, because capitalism would, would kind of shake out the system, because why would someone be motivated to participate mm -hmm. if they're not capturing any value? Yeah. So if the value shifts, are they still going to be able to participate? You, you follow the logic I'm trying I to- I definitely do. Yeah, yeah. I think what I would say to that is we expect and we encourage and we will absolutely heavily invest in more business model innovation in the area of open source. So what, what I mean by that is, um, and, and, and it's important to sort of like qualify a few things there. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge amount of polarization and lack of consensus, lack of industry consensus on what it actually means to have or implement an open source based business model. In fact, there's a lot of people who just sort of point blanketly assert that an open source business model does not exist. Um, we believe that many business models for monetizing and commercializing open source exist. Uh, we've blogged and written about a few of them. There's services and training and support. There's open core, which is very effective in sort of a spectrum of ways to implement open core. You can have a, uh, you know, around the core, you can have a, a thin crust or a thick crust. Um, there's SaaS. There are hardware-based distribution models, things like Sourcefire and Cumulus Networks. Yeah. Um, and there are also um, network-based approaches. So for example, project, uh, uh, called Storage or Storage A, uh, uh, being um, developed and, and uh, run now by Ben, ben Golub, mm -hmm. who's the former um, uh, CEO yeah, of Docker. Cube alumni. Uh, ben, Ben's, Ben's really great, open source veteran. You know, this is a, a network, kind of decentralized network-based approach of you know, sort of right-sizing the, uh, the production and the consumption of the resource of a storage-based open source project in a decentralized network. So those are sort of four, I guess, four or five ways so, of commercializing so value. However, however, four or five ways of commercializing value. However, what we believe is that there will be more business model innovation. There will be more developments around how you can better capture um, more or in different ways the value that open source creates. However, what I'll say though is um, it is unrealistic to expect two things. It's unrealistic and in fact unfair to expect that any of those constituents will contribute back to open source proportional to the value that they receive from it or the benefit. And I'm actually paraphrasing Doug Cutting there who tweeted this a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. very profoundly deep wise tweet, um, which I very strongly agree with. And it is also unrealistic to expect a second thing, which is that any of those constituents can capture a material portion of the value that open source creates which I would, I would assert is many trillions of dollars, p perhaps tens of trillions of dollars. It's really hard to quantify that. Yep. Uh, and it's not just dollars in economic sense, it's dollars in productivity, time saved, new markets, new sure. areas, and so on. Yeah, I think this is interesting, and I think that you know, will, will be an open, open book. And I, but I will say that what I've observed in looking through all these CUBE interviews, I think business model innovation absolutely is something that is an IP. We need it. Well, it's, it's now intellectual property. The business yep. model isn't, hey, I went to business school, learn this at Babson or Harvard, I learned this business model, we're going to do SaaS, freemium. Okay, I get that. There's, there's going to be very interesting new innovations coming. And yep. I think that's the new IP. Yeah. Because open source, if it's community based, there's going to be formulas. Yep. So that's going to be interesting. Okay, so now let's get back to the actual um, funding uh, itself. You guys are doing early stage. Can you take us through the approach? We're very focused on early stage um, investing and backing teams that are just sort of welcoming the idea of a commercial entity around their open source project mm -hmm. or building, uh, building, building a business fundamentally dependent on an open source project or, 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 or um, uh, or maybe even more than one. And uh, the reason for that is this is really where there's a lot of structural inefficiency in supporting and backing those types of founders. Yeah, and I think one of the things uh, with CoreOS, I noticed with that acquisition, they were pure on the open source side, doing a great job, 
didn't want to push the business model too hard because in open source, let's face it, you got people that, hey, you know, I don't want to get caught on the business side and get yeah. revenue, perverse incentives might come up or fear of incentives sure. that might be yep. different yep. or not aligned. Um, it was a great value for Red Hat. So, I think so. Um, so Red Hat got a steal on that one. But you know, as you go forward, there's going to be certainly a lot more stuff. We're seeing a lot of it now in CNCF, for instance. I want to get your thoughts on this because being the co-founder of KubeCon and donating it to the CNCF, um, Kubernetes is the hottest thing on the planet, as we talked about many years ago. Um, what's your take on that now? Absolutely exciting things happening. Um, what is the impact of Kubernetes, in your opinion, to the world, and where do you see that evolving rapidly, and where is the focus areas that people should be paying attention to? <clears throat> I think that Kubernetes replaces EC2. Um, Kubernetes is a disaggregated API for distributed computing anywhere. And it happens to be portable, and able to run on any kind of compute infrastructure, which sort of makes it like a, um, a, a liquid disaggregated EC2-like API, which a lot of people have been sort of chasing and trying to implement for many years with things like OpenStack or Eucalyptus. But interestingly, Kubernetes is sort of the right abstraction for distributed computing because it meets people where they are architecturally. It's sort of aligned with this current movement around distributed systems first designs, mm -hmm. microservices, packaging things in small compart compartmentalized Good components. for integra integrating um, existing stuff. Absolutely, and it's very composable, unopinionated architecturally. So you, know, you can sort of take, take uh, uh, an application and structure it in any given way, and as long as it has the sort of isolation boundary of a container, you can run it on Kubernetes without needing to sort of retrofit the architecture, which is really, which is really awesome. Um, I think Kubernetes is, is a foundational part of the next kind of computing paradigm in the same way that Linux was foundational to the computing paradigm that gave rise to the internet. Um, you know, we, ha we had uh, commodity hardware meeting open source based um, sort of cost reduction and efficiency, which, which really yeah. Linux enabled, and, and the movement toward you know, scale out data center infrastructure that, that supported the internet's, you know, sort of maturity and in infrastructure. I think we're starting to see the same type of repeat effect, yeah. um, thanks to Kubernetes uh, basically being uh, really well received by engineers, by, yeah. by the cloud providers. It's now, you know, the, the universal sort of standard for running container-based applications on, on the different cloud providers. And I think the, having the uh, non-technical opinion posture as you said, or architecture posture, allows it to be uh, compatible with a, a new yes. kind of heterogeneous. Yeah. Heterogeneity is critical. Heterogeneity is key, because it's not just within the environment, it's also within each vendor yeah. or customer yeah. has more heterogeneity. Yeah. So, so, okay, now that's key. So multi-cloud, I want to get your thoughts on multi-cloud, yeah. because now this goes into some of the things that might build on top of if Kubernetes continues to go down mm -hmm. the road that you say it mm -hmm. does. Then the next question is stateful applications, right. service meshes. A lot of buzzwords, a lot of buzzwords in there. I mean, I think like, I mean, so stateful, stateful applications is real because at a certain point in time you have a, a maturity curve with uh, critical infrastructure that starts to become appealing for stateful mission critical storage systems, which is typically where you have all the crown jewels mm -hmm. of a given company's uh, infrastructure, um, whether it's a transactional system mm -hmm. or reading and writing core customer mm -hmm. or financial, financial service information or whatever it is. So Kubernetes starting to hit this like maturity curve where people are migrating really serious mission critical storage workloads onto that, onto that platform. And obviously you know, we're going to start to see yeah. even more, even more critical workloads. We're starting to see edge, edge workloads because Kubernetes is a pretty low footprint system. Yeah. So you can run on edge devices, you can run, yeah. even run on microcontrollers. Um, you know, we're sort of past the experimental, yeah. you know, fun and games with Raspberry Pi, <laughs> uh, Pi, 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 Pi uh, sort of towers, and people actually legitimately doing real-world edge kind of yeah. deployments with with Kubernetes. Um, we're absolutely starting to see um, multi-geo, multi-replication, multi-cloud yeah. sort of style architectures becoming real uh, as well, because Kubernetes is this. API that the industry is agreeing upon sufficiently. We actually have agreement around this sort of surface area for distributed system yeah. style yeah. computing that if cloud providers can actually standardize on it in a way that lets um, application specific vendors or new types of application deployment models um, yeah. innovate further, then we can really unlock 
this sort of tight coupling of yeah. proprietary services um, in inside cloud providers and disaggregate it, which is which is really which is really exciting. I, mean, I think I, I, I forget I forget the um, the Netscape uh, Jim Barksdale uh, bundling unbundling. Yeah. Um, we're starting to see the unbundling of proprietary cloud computing service APIs, things like Kinesis and uh, ALB and ELB and proprietary storage services yeah. and these other sticky services um, get unbundled because of two big things: open source. Obviously, we have open source alternative data paths. And then we have Kubernetes, which yeah. allows us to sort of disaggregate things out pretty easily. I want to get your thoughts, one final concept before we break, because I was having a conversa private conversation with three people yep. besides myself. Um, a big time CIO of a company that if I said the name, everyone would go, oh my God, that guy's huge. He's, he's seen it all going back many, many ways. Currently tons a lot of innovation. Um, a hardcore network chip guy who knows networking, old school, old school infrastructure. And then um, a cloud uh, native application uh, founder who knows a lot about software development and is state-of-the-art cloud native. So cloud native, all, all experience, old school, kind of about my age. A cloud native app developer, uh, big time CIO, and a chip networking kind of infrastructure guy. And, they, and I, we were talking, and one thing that came out, I wanted to get your thoughts on this. He says, so what's going on with DevOps? How do you see this you know, service meshes, a stateful web, top of the stack, no stacks, horizontally scalable. And um, the comment that came out was, storage and networking have had this relationship with everything since day one. Yeah. Network moves a packet from point A to point B and nothing happens in between, maybe some inspection, and storage goes from here, now to then, because right. you store it. Right. He goes, that premise moves up the stack, so then the, the cloud native guy goes, well that's what's happening up at the top. There's a lot of moving things around, workloads and or services, yes. provisioning services, yes. and then from, here, from, from now to then, yep. state, yep. in real time. Yep. And what, what dawned on the next conversation, the CIO goes, well, this is exactly our challenge. We have under the hood, infrastructure being programmable. <laughs> My phone's calling me. Program programmable connections. Okay, programmable phone. So you got the programmable at the top of the stack too. So the, the CIO said, that's exactly the problem we're trying to solve. We're trying yeah. to solve some of these network storage yeah. concepts now at an application level. Yeah. Your, your thoughts to that. Well, I think if I could tease apart everything you just said, which is a very profound synthesis of uh, a lot of different things, I think we've we've started to see application logic uh, leak out of application code itself into dedicated layers that are really good at doing one specific thing. Um, and so, like traditionally, we had you know sort of some CRUD style kind of behavioral semantics implemented around business logic. Mm -hmm. And then inside of that, you also had libraries for doing, you know, connectivity and lookups and service discovery and locking and key management and encryption and, you know, uh, coordination with other types of applications and all that stuff was sort of like shoved into the single big application binary. And now we're starting to see all of those like language runtime specific parts of application code sort of crack or leak out into these dedicated, highly scalable, Unix philosophy oriented sort of like layers. So things like Envoy are really just built for the sort of um, nervous system layer of kind of application communication fabric yeah. um, up and down the, 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 the layer two through layer seven sort of protocol uh, transport stack, which is really profound. Um, we're seeing things like uh, Vault from HashiCorp handle you know secure key storage uh, uh, persistence of application um, authentication, authorization, you know, metadata and information to sort of access different systems and endpoints. And that's a dedicated sort of stateful layer that you can sort of fragment out um, and, and, and delegate um, mm -hmm. sort of uh, you know, uh, application specific functionality to, which is, really, which is really great for scalability reasons. And on and on and on. And so you know, we, 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 we've, we've started to see that and I, and I think one way of looking at that is it's a cycle. Uh, it's the sort of bundling and unbundling aspect. Yeah. Um, the sort or the of granular levels of services are getting really low level. Code. Yeah, it's a sort of like bundling, unbundling, and so we've, we've got all this unbundling happening out of application code to these dedicated layers. The bundling back may happen. Um, you know, I've actually s s seen a, a few, you know, sort of Bay Area companies go like, we're going back to the monolith because it actually gives us lots of efficiencies and things that you know we thought were trade offs before. But we're, you know, we're actually comfortable with a big mono repo and. Uh, one or two core languages, and we're going to like build everything into these big binaries, and everyone's going to sort of live in the same source code. 
repository and break things out through folders or whatever. I mean, there's, there's a lot of really interesting things. I don't yeah. want to say we're, we're sort of clear on where this bundling unbundling is happening, but I do think that there's a lot of unbundling happening right now. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity there. And the sure. open source obviously driving it. So, so final question for you, how many deals have you done? Can you talk a little bit about the firm um, and exciting things and plans that you have going forward? Yeah, we're going to be making a lot of announcements over the next few months. And we're, I guess, extremely thrilled. I don't want to say overwhelmed because we're able to handle all of the, uh, the, the volume and in inquiries and, and inbound interest. Um, we're, we're really, really honored and thrilled by the, the reception uh, over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. from announcing the firm on the 1st of October, uh, sort of before the Horton, Hortonworks Cloudera merger, you know, the, the, the JFrog uh, funding announcement that week, the Elastic IPO, just a lot of really awesome things happened yeah. that week. Yeah. This is obviously before Microsoft open sourced all their patents. Um, we'll be announcing more investments that we've made. We announced our first yeah. one on the 1st uh, of October as well with, uh, with the announcement of the firm. Um, we've made a good number of, uh, 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 of investments. We're not able to talk too much about uh, our, our, our first, uh, our, our first um, sort of um, uh, 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 sort of uh, initiative, but you'll hear more about that in, in the near future. Well, we're excited. I think it's the timing's perfect. I know you've been working on, on this kind of vision for a while, and I think it's a really great timing. Congratulations, Thank JJ. Thank you so much. Thanks so Joseph, much for having me on. Joseph Jackson, also known as JJ, founder and general partner of OSS Capital, open source software capital. Um, Co-founder of KubeCon, which is now part of the CNCF, a uh, real great player in the in the community and the ecosystem. Great to have him on the Cube. Thanks for coming in. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. Thanks, John.